The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, The Connected Car 2016, Electronics and Software Impacting the Service Car Industry, presented by IHS Market. The Auto Care Association and IHS Market are leading sources of information, analytics, and expertise in forging solutions that shape the automotive aftermarket. This is the second webinar in our industry webinar series featuring experts on key issues currently facing the industry. Today's webinar is presented by Colin Bird, IHS Market's Senior Analyst, Software, Apps, and Services. Today, he will discuss how electronics and software in modern vehicles may impact the vehicle service and repair industry, or the do-it-for-me industry, by forcing more customers into specific channels, such as franchised car dealers, who may be the only channel equipped with the tools and expertise to service these types of vehicle software. He will also shed light on consumer desirability of specific telematics, infotainment, comfort and safety features, desired telematics services, and concerns with the idea of self-driving cars. At the end of the presentation, he will be fielding questions, so be sure to submit your questions using the chat feature in your control panel. Thank you again for joining, and with that, I will turn it over to Colin. Thanks, Susan, and hello, everyone. Um, like Susan said, my name is Colin Bird, and I'm a senior analyst here uh, focused on software apps and services and consumer insights uh, with IHS Market. Um, this is a brief overview of the agenda, so I'm going to do some quick highlights um, of where the market is uh, for infotainment and connected vehicle um, electronics. Um, then I'll go into the key takeaways of our connected car consumer survey. Uh, and then, uh, with uh, time permitting, we'll do a Q&A. So uh, first, let me actually let me go over real quickly what the consumer survey is. So uh, I have a background in consumer research as well as um, uh, automotive insights, uh, and I've been doing this for uh, a little over 10 years now. Uh, this is the fourth year we've done the consumer market research uh, survey. Uh, this year, we're calling it the Connected Car Consumer Survey at IHS Market. Um, uh, what that entails is a statistically weighted sample um, of 1,000 respondents in the U.S. Uh, and then in, and in, in three other countries, 1,000 additional respondents, so the United Kingdom, Germany, and China, so a total of 4,000 uh, respondents for the survey. Uh, we completed the survey in March, so the data is pretty fresh. Uh, these are new car intenders, and they already own a brand new vehicle and uh, the respondents plan to be personally involved in the purchasing decision of the vehicle. So that's just a little background of our sample here. And before we go into um, the, the insights of that, uh, we're going to just go over some other uh, forecasting that we do uh, just to bring some context to this market. So this is a pretty uh, um, uh, frenetic uh, chart here showing the technological investments uh, we're seeing in vehicles today. So uh, we estimate that more than 50% of the value of a vehicle today is now in its software or its electronic components like the um, uh, electronic control units. Um, and that amounts to about uh, 20 to 30 million lines of code. Um, you're talking about having at least 50 or 60 electronic control units in the vehicle. And when you add up what the microcontrollers, about 80 microprocessors, um, and they control everything in the vehicle and, and, and usually on at least five in vehicle networks that are all interconnected. So through an infotainment system, as you've seen um, with uh, the, the recent Jeep recall, you could uh, control um, uh, various uh, body control and, and braking control systems. Um, so a very interconnected vehicle. Um, and, and then we're looking towards the not so distant future having over 100 ECU and MCUs in the vehicle. We, we do expect there to be consolidation as more powerful um, microprocessors are used in the vehicle, and over 200 million lines of code, so uh, 10 times as many as today. And uh, just to keep in mind, you know, this is a little thing that um, I was thinking about when writing the cybersecurity report, but for every 1,000 lines of code 
there's usually one vulnerability or bug in that in that code. So there's going to be a lot of service on the software side in the future. And this is just to uh, to bring to light the amount of uh, telematics units in the market. So the U.S. was the first to have telematics um, uh, it, through OnStar, and now you're seeing it more widespread in other countries. So um, this telematics in, in general that's the sending or receiving or the storing of information uh, related to vehicle tracking. But uh, more recently, too, you're talking about bringing uh, the general uh, World Wide Web into the vehicle this way, uh, too, and through um, uh, in-vehicle wi uh, Wi-Fi hotspots. Uh, so you can see here the U.S. has a car park with about 55 million vehicles that have telematics in them. Uh, and we expect that still to be the largest market um, over our forecast period. Uh, we expect about three quarters of vehicles in the U.S. Um, that are going to be sold are going to have telematic systems. Uh, and then now you see the developed Western European countries um, having an increased market share here as well, and then even in emerging markets in China. So another thing I track are um, um, app integration solutions like Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. We call them mirroring solutions. They usually operate on some sort of middleware. Um, so right here we're showing vehicles that are going to be enabled um, with bringing your smartphone in the vehicle. And this has implications to the consumer uh, insights I'm going to show. So you can see here that um, this is the attach rate on new cars. We're looking at about 45%. Um, for the global market, having these um, over the forecast period at the end of the, by 2022 for CarPlay and for Android Auto. Android Auto is not going to have as great penetration in China, um, and that's just due to restrictions to Google services right now in China that may change in the future. In the U.S. in particular, Smart Device Link, or what used to be called Ford App Link, um, is going to have a higher market share than what you're seeing here. And we expect it to increase over time as more uh, OEMs join smart device links. So, as as many as as many of you know, uh, Toyota's made a commitment to join uh, and use smart device link as a mirroring solution. And we expect other OEMs to too. And and the reason for that being, um, it's a third party solution that lends a lot of control for the car manufacturers to allow certain types of apps into the vehicle, uh, unlike Apple CarPlay and, and Android Auto. It also allows them to control um, where the data, the privacy of the data, and the amount of data that they share um, with uh, third-party providers, unlike CarPlay or um, or Android Auto, uh, and and it also allows for more vehicle-centric control. So they're going to allow that um, smart device link to be connected to more in-vehicle data. Um, um, so that, so that you'll have more driver-centric controls in that as well. This is another slide. This is showing internet radio subscribers um, that uh, use internet radio in the in the car. Uh, similar to telematics, in general, with this, the U.S. consumer is on the vanguard of of uh, technology adoption. Um, and so, right now, we're looking at about close, almost 20 million subscribers in the U.S. using internet radio. Um, and uh, we expect the U.S. to be the leader of that um, throughout this forecast period. Uh, later, we're going to show some consumer insights to what type of uh, on-demand or internet radio uh, U.S. consumers are using. And this is the last slide just showing uh, the impact on the market of over-the-air updates. So this is going to have implications, obviously, on, on the service side. As, as more vehicles have telematics um, and are connected to the web, they're going to have the ability for the software to be updated over the web. I mean, this is even still a recent phenomenon in, in smartphones. It was only something that was introduced um, in 2003, and now all, all smartphones are updated this way, and you see that permeating throughout consumer electronics now coming into the car. So the first one that you're seeing here, um, just to explain these different segments, are telematic control units, or the uh, electronic control unit that controls the telematic system. Um, that is updating the firmware for those. So OnStar uh, a few years ago did an update, a firmware update to fix the security flaw um, to the TCU this way. Um, you see a lot of TCUs having that ability as, a, as the mechanism that's sending and receiving data to be able to, to update the TCU. Uh, the next one that we see are MAP and um, software over there, um, so software over there updates for infotainment OS. Um, uh, two years ago now, Ford, um, Ford announced um, a big change for Sync 3, that it would be 
uh, able to be updated over the air. Um, and obviously, before that, um, Ford had a lot of issues with their infotainment system, operating system. So that's uh, something that pushed them to do that and compelled them to do that. Uh, you're going to see map over the air updates, the similar that you see on smartphones now, moving to um, uh, moving to over the air as well. So, and then the final um, and probably the one that's going to have the greatest impact on the service industry is being able to do core ECU updates. So that's going to be for the powertrain, uh, body control, braking systems, um, uh, uh, HVAC control, climate control, things like this. Um, you already see that on Tesla vehicles, but beyond that, there aren't many vehicles that have the capability. A lot of OEMs are specking electron, uh, electrical architectures that are going to have that capacity in the future for not only electric vehicles, where it does make more sense because uh, those are often engineered in, a, in, a, in an approach that's similar to consumer electronics, but you're going to start to see it move more into ICE vehicles too or internal combustion engine vehicles. So that's just a general background of uh, where the industry is at today and where, where we think it's going. So these are some key insights to our consumer survey. And so first, we're just going to start with where, where the respondents in this survey are. And so keep in mind that these are respondents that already own a new car. And in general, it tends to skew the, the data for China um, because most Chinese new car intenders are still on, on not having a car and buying their first car. So as you can see here, um, this is a question asking if you have an infotainment system on your current vehicle and, and an overwhelming majority of Chinese respondents say that they do, while less than a majority in the other markets uh, say that they do. So again, that's, a, that's being skewed there by an elite group that are being asked this question in China. But as you can see, that there's still, there's still a, a, almost a majority in most markets that have an infotainment system, so they're familiar with this technology. This is uh, another survey respondent question, and this is more about what type of uh, operating system you have on your smart on your most used smartphone. So you can see here that Android OS uh, dominates the smartphone market uh, among new car intenders, as it does in the, in the actual smartphone market. But unlike the uh, actual smartphone market, Apple has a much stronger presence here. So they're not they're not that far distant second. In the U.S., they're almost at parity, um, and so Android smartphone. Uh, and Android smartphone users were more likely to own older vehicles, uh, and they said they were less likely to pay um, less likely to pay as much on their next new car purchase as iOS users. So they tend to own older vehicles, uh, less likely to own luxury vehicles, and more likely to say that they're going to spend less on their uh, their next new vehicle. Uh, we also did this data by carriers. So this will give you an example in the U.S. AT and G and Verizon control two thirds of uh, the respondent base here in terms of connectivity, um, and that has implications for telematics, so a lot of telematics service providers, um, they are um, one of the telematics service provider, pr providers is Verizon, um, another major one is Sprint, and AT&T has also made a play into this market. Um, they're starting to do shared data plans where you add your vehicle as a, um, as a device, so this would have implications on where the market is, um, and you see it skewed towards AT&T there. Um, in the UK, um, that, that's a market that's much more dynamic, and so you see EE and O2 doing well there. Um, you see T-Mobile and O2 and Vodafone doing really well in Germany with uh, three-fourths of the market there. In China, China is a market that's controlled by very large state-run companies, and China Mobile controls uh, for the new car intenders about 75% of the market. Uh, again, just staying on smartphones for a minute because it has a lot of implications of what we're going to talk about here. Uh, the vast majority of the data plans uh, that are being used here are in the one to five gigabyte data plans. Uh, there aren't many people using family plans as outside of the U.S. So that's just kind of where the where the data connection and and where that part of the market is. That also has implications because a lot of a lot of uh, systems are now able to connect the smartphone and use it as uh, consumer brought in telematics to update apps on the infotainment system. So also has implications on that as well. And so a big part of the survey is, is testing across these 21 attributes. Uh, we are asking the desirability of having these in your next vehicle with a focus really on the technology and using the, the more um, comfort, like uh, automatic climate control as more of a barometer or a CD player here. Uh, we are also going to ask, um, do you want these features to be standard? Are you willing to um, pay for these features, uh, and then how much as well. So these are some of the questions here. And, and what you can see is a blind spot detection 
is not only the most desired uh, crash avoidance technology or ADAS feature, but it, it's also one of the most desired features overall uh, across a broad subset of technology and comfort features as well. So blind spot monitoring systems have been proven to uh, reduce insurance claims and vehicle damage. Um, and so the other ADAS features you see here are, are automatic emergency braking. There's a high desirability for that. Adaptive cruise control and lane departure warning as well. And those all ranked really high, highly desirable. Uh, and again, from the, uh, the the Highway Loss Data Institute, they've, they've, almost all of those features have been proven to actually have a material impact on insurance claims. So there seems to be value there, and consumers understand that. Uh, interestingly, for like from an infotainment standpoint, uh, the touchscreen infotainment, uh, internet streaming, radio, and telematic systems, they scored much lower than those safety features, but they're still high. You're looking at almost a majority for all of those, except for telematics. Uh, finding those desirable. And then features that have a very specific use case, um, typically for families, of, uh, for instance, air roosted entertainment, that has a, a less um, desirability amongst all new car intenders. So this is the same question, but now we're asking, essentially, should this be standard? And what you can see here is fairly common features like CD player, steering wheel mounted controls, and Bluetooth are expected to be standard in the car, and that is a norm in the market as it is today. Uh, interestingly, 65% of consumers also desire navigation, um, and they want that to be standard. And we believe that has to deal with the ubiquity of free smartphone-based turn-by-turn navigations, uh, which is probably the culprit on uh, uh, consumer expectations of the value there, expecting that to be almost a necessity at this point. Uh, typically, ADAS features that we talked about earlier, they're packaged as an optional feature, uh, and they're usually packaged with something like leather or high-end high infotainment systems. But clearly, consumers, as you can see here, are expecting those to be standards in cars today. Uh, we believe that to be a learned behavior based on previous studies on, uh, on where cons what consumers see as the expectation of a safety feature, and they expect it to be something that's there, uh, something that's standard. And, and it, it, you see that it, Similar, similarly, when uh, it was an option for electronic stability control or precharged brakes or ABS, uh, that, that wasn't something that consumers were really willing to spend extra on. They wanted it to be a standard feature. And so these are, these are the consumers that are willing to spend extra on the feature. And so what you're seeing here is that um, that rear scene entertainment, there's a high, there's a high degree of, of people willing to to spend extra on that, which is good, because that is often is something that's uh, optional. Same thing with branded audio uh, systems here. Uh, again, like we mentioned, there isn't a strong desirability of, of, of paying extra for ADAS features. Uh, interestingly, uh, while CD player is uh, the lowest here, the, the, the consumer is willing to spend extra. They're willing to spend the most out of any of these features, something like eight to $900. And that has a lot to do with the movement towards mechless infotainment or display audio systems. Um, and we use the word mechless uh, to mean having no optical drive, something that you first saw in the consumer electronic industry. And now you see it sort of permeating through um, in, in vehicle head units as well. So there's still a, uh, a small um, group there of audio files that really like having a CD player or having a more um, rich um, audio source than uh, streaming, streaming radio or digital broadcasts. So we previously talked about telematics. We asked additional questions on, on many of these features here. So this is a specific question for those that said that they thought telematics is desirable. And what we're asking here is essentially what, what are the features that you want? Um, and automatic crash notification, uh, which is what most consumers really think what telematics is about, is the one that uh, ranks the highest here. All of them rank pretty low. Uh, what we think is happening here is that uh, consumers don't really understand what telematics is or what it's supposed to entail. Um, I think that a lot of OEMs, um, from my conversations with them, are still having uh, are still struggling to really fully communicate the full value of telematics. Uh, as you can see here, more recent features that have been added, like concierge services or family services, or or um, family services would would entail a lot of geo geofencing type services. Um, those aren't being necessarily valued here, so that's a concern. So 
So this uh, survey also did a lot of questions on behavioral and attitudinal questions. So this is this one right here is asking about smartphone usage in the cars. So you can see that there's a near unanimous agreement that using a smartphone in the car is distracting. There are a lot of laws around that, and there's been a lot of awareness brought to that that it's 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 uh, distracting. But you can also see that a majority of consumers are looking for a way to use the in-vehicle HMI to sort of augment that and and uh, be able to use their smartphone in the car in a safe fashion. So, using Bluetooth protocol for either um, for for doing over the, uh, for doing voice calls, or then using a more advanced Bluetooth protocol to do um, uh, Bluetooth audio streaming, which is fairly standard in ve uh, new vehicles today. Um, you see a lot of um, users wanting to be able to control their smartphone with um, tactile controls on the steering wheel, uh, using the touchscreen in the car. Um, there are a lot of users here saying that they use their, their smartphone as a navigation aid. What was interesting when we asked if you had an embedded navigation system on your current vehicle, those consumers were even more likely to say that they use their smartphone as a, in, uh, as a navigation aid which sort of speaks again to the value um, or, or lack of it in the embedded navigation systems that are currently being offered in new cars. So there seems to be a disconnect here between what is being, uh, what consumers are seeing on the consumer electronic side and then what they're getting in their in-vehicle embedded systems. So we're out, we also asked additional questions on what are the most used apps um, smartphone and apps in your car, and so again, alluding to navigation being really important here. Navigation is that one that a majority of, of consumers say that they would use, that they do use in their vehicle, and that's followed by weather, music, and news, and that makes sense. Uh, those are also um, top features or applications offered on a, on an infotainment system. Uh, more interestingly are the messaging type systems like uh, social networking here, or just a general messaging system. You're starting to see certain solutions, so you're seeing Android Auto opened up an API that allows apps that are messaging apps to be communicated through uh, Android Auto. Uh, CarPlay hasn't done anything like that yet, and then there are some embedded navigation uh, infotainment systems that also offer that as well. And so earlier I alluded to this uh, about internet streaming radio, and so these are the the um, the most used music services in, in the U.S. in the car. So Pandora is about a third of the market, and again, that makes sense. The um, Pandora Automotive Protocol has been has has, has permeated the market um, over the last six years uh, for infotainment systems, and that's one of the chief ways now until you have a newer infotainment system with uh, CarPlay or, or Android Auto. Uh, that's your chief way of um, using um, internet uh, streaming radio in the car. Um, and then that's followed by Spotify. When we trend this data, Spotify is, is, um, is increased by 50% um, um, uh, market share from last year, and it continues to increase over, this, um, over the last four um, surveys we've done. Um, this is the first year that we've uh, tracked uh, Apple Music. Last year it was called uh, Beats Music, but um, when you add in both Apple solutions, it's about 13% share here of this market. Um, and then Amazon does well as well um, does well in this too. So the one that um, was a little concerning that also did a big play was iHeartMedia and, and the automotive protocols. And so we've seen that their share decline over this uh, over these last four surveys, and it declined by more than uh, half um, from last year. So about four percent. Last year they had eight percent of this market. And so just switching gears, we also did some, this is the first year that we asked a little bit about uh, autonomous cars. So this is, would you, would you ride in a self-driving car? Would you purchase one? Would you ride in a self-driving car and, and not purchase one? So those are the uh, Ubers and the, and the Lyfts uh, of the world, the cars as the car a service. And then there's the, the folks not willing to do either and then those who don't know. So uh, in general, millennials are more likely to be interested in, in purchasing a self-driving car and and the Chinese respondent base tracked most closely with uh, millennials here. So you have more than half the market um, saying that in China, willing to buy an autonomous car, and then about a third saying that they would do car as a service. Um, U.S. tracking a little bit better here than Germany or the U.K., but uh, all, all of these markets are a little concerning. Um, and the next slide I'm going to show what it looks like in terms of generations uh, for the U.S., uh, and so you can see here that the U.S. millennials track almost perfectly with the Chinese respondent base. Um, and so millennials across the world and, and, and also Germany and, and U.K. track similarly. So 
younger respondents are willing to, to buy an, um, an autonomous car. Um, even though most people have never driven in anything like this, they're willing to take that chance. So that, that's, that's good. Um, and, but the enthusiasm skews a little too young at, for the purpose of autonomous car, which is the elongate, elongate mobility or enhanced mobility in either those too young to drive or those now too old to drive. So it's a little concerning what the baby boomers, especially um, for new car intenders, they make up half the market. Um, and, and we they will be a driving force of autonomous car sales as they have the household income to purchase them. Uh, they're going to be very expensive in the first um, in the first decade. So you see nearly three-fourths of baby boomers either don't know or would not drive or would not purchase a self-driving car. And that's concerning. It, those people that are age 65 years or older in the U.S., it's about 45 million people today. Um, by the end of this forecast period, it'd be about 72 million people. So it's a big market there. Um, we do expect this these attitudes that change over time as autonomous cars um, enter the market and, and, and are ultimately prove, proven to be safe. And uh, I thought I had one more slide in there. I'll, I'll just let me make one more comment here about autonomous cars. So we had, a, we had asked another question about your level of concern as well um, for vehicles that have steering wheel, uh, or have no steering wheels, have no pedals. I'm sure you guys saw yesterday that Ford announced that they're going to make a vehicle like that and have it in the market by 2021. Uh, there's and across the market, across the board, it's all in the 90 to 80 percent in every region. There's deep concern about the capability of a um, self-driving car to drive uh, in inclement weather, uh, to be driven with nobody in the vehicle, um, and to drive in a vehicle with steering wheel uh, with no steering wheel or no pedals. So we expect that to dissipate over time as consumers actually get acclimated and drive in these types of vehicles. But for now, the, the concern is very high. And uh, that leaves us plenty plenty of time here for questions. And I don't know if um, Susan, if you if you have any questions uh, that are coming yeah, through. Thanks, Con. We have a couple questions here. Um, again, if you have a question, please submit it now in the chat feature. First one: How do these te technological advances affect the service industry? Sure. Yeah, that's a good that's a good and, and important question for this uh, for this uh, webinar. Um, I would say that over time, um, the emphasis, and you've already seen it, you've already seen this happen since the Clean Air Act and since uh, the first uh, uh, electronic uh, fuel injector went into a car, um, there's going to be more emphasis on scanning tools and reprogramming tools and being certified and being able to reprogram or being able to repair control uh, electronic control units or, or other modules in the vehicle. Um, I would expect to see the service industry at Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yep, we got now you, Colin. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. I'm on a cell phone, everyone. Um, so I think what you're going to also see, where just continuing where I was, uh, where I led off, um, you're going to continue to see uh, further lobbying for new regulations at, at the state, but ultimately at the federal level, um, to allow those proprietary OVD2 trees to be open for repairs. So a lot of obviously the OVD2 diagnostics have been have been open, but there's a lot of proprietary information there um, that still is not open for the service industry beyond the franchise car dealers. So that needs to be. Uh, worked through um, our political bodies here and, and regulation brought to it to, to be open and, and make it a more fair market. Um, there are a lot of software technologies that continue to be standardized in the vehicle and, and that's just because suppliers, tier two, tier three suppliers really cannot um, keep up with this level of the software advancement. So you see standardization and it's been going on for a while, a lot of it through AutoZar. So that's going to have a benefit for the independent service industry because there's at least a shared platforms here. Um, and 
there, there will be eventually a simplification in the vehicle buses. We expect them all to move to Ethernet, move away from CAN bus and, and flex ray and things like that and move over to an Ethernet protocol. Um, we do expect that maybe to to have an uh, impact of allowing the service industry to maybe better um, service these vehicles. Um, another issue in the longer term, so I just wrote a report on, uh, on cybersecurity solutions. So cyber, the first cybersecurity solutions being implemented in the car are firewalls. So, so that's going to be another impact of not only this proprietary code, but now you're going to have a firewall that you have to get through, either through the automotive gateway or through the telematics control unit, or there's going to be a firewall in the OBD2 port and probably any of the RF signals uh, that are coming through for um, um, uh, tire pressure monitoring systems. So there's, there's going to be difficulty at the firewall level, and that's something else that's either going to be regulatory or some sort of agreement between uh, the service industry here and the OEMs. Um, I think, and, and where the independent service industry usually, I think, caters more towards older vehicles is my assumption here. Um, I, I think that the software, as, as we move to more software-oriented vehicles here, a lot of that software will only be serviced by suppliers for maybe a 10 or 15-year period. So if the average car is about 12 years old, there's a lot of opportunity on the older car side um, for for aftermarket software or independent service care to maintain that software, uh, particularly, um, I would say, for cybersecurity or for fixing vulnerabilities and flaws. Um, I've seen most suppliers that are looking at cybersecurity, looking at contracts that are going to be about 10 to 13 years um, service um, with the OE, um, the OE parts or with the OEM. So there's opportunity there to maintain the uh, cybersecurity of older vehicles. I alluded earlier to um, over-the-air updates, so that's a big thing that um, car dealers, franchise car dealers are either battling, either they, they're they slowing it down, at least in the U.S., compared to other markets, and um, they're slowing it down because it has an impact on, on recalls. So a big portion of recalls today are software-related recalls. So we, 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 we um, have looked at it, and it looks like per software recall, you're looking at about 24,000 units over a 20-year period. About 530 models have been have been recalled uh, due to software. It's a huge expense for OEMs. So if you look at um, if you look at the cybersecurity um, recall that uh, Chrysler had to do for their infotainment system last year, uh, we we are, we think that the USB um, recall that they did that was about 10 million dollars just to, to mail everyone a USB drive. And then they had a really low success rate, so a lot of people brought their car into a car dealer, right? And so that was about 65 million to 70 million dollars in service tickets for franchise car dealers. So there's a lot of there's there's a lot of money on the on the software related recalls, and there's a lot of resistance for the over the air updates. But ultimately, when we move the over the air updates, I do think that there's opportunity there there as well for independent car dealers. Um, uh, you you see certain suppliers um, showing or demonstrating um, a, a framework for OBD2 systems. Um, uh, Bluetooth OBD2 systems that would be able to transmit over the air updates and like I said earlier all these all, all the buses are usually connected through the OBD2 and and ultimately um, any sort of application packet that you're trying to send should be able to travel through that system and and update the either the um, electronic component or the ECU or the MCU or whatever you're trying to get updated so I could even see an opportunity on the independent server side to get in the over the air updates as well. So that's some of the things I was thinking about about this. Okay, thanks, Colin. We had quite a few more questions here. Do the features sure. desired do the features desired plus standard consumers expect vary based on country surveyed or are they consistent globally? So in the U.S. in the U.S. and China, the the Chinese respondent was the most aspirational. Uh, they were the most likely to say uh, almost all the features were desirable. In the U.S., it was much more skewed towards um, desirability of the ADAS systems, of infotainment systems. Um, the U.K. skewed a little bit less, um, and, and Germany less so, wanting the uh, the desirability of infotainment systems and advanced um, in-car um, electronic systems, and a lot of that has to do with, um, especially in Germany, a focus on driving ultimately and, and not so much being entertained in the car, so it's just a different mindset there, uh, focusing on the road. 
Um, in Germany and the UK, there was much more emphasis on, on car-centric data, so um, navigation-type data um, and, and driver-centric data, so uh, data related to um, um, uh, fuel economy coaching or point of interest data and things like that. Okay, thank you. Um, we have one more, actually. What is the distinction between autonomous vehicles and self-driving vehicles? Sure. So for this, the purposes of the survey, we we asked it both ways because that, that's the the most common way that we see consumers um, understanding what that word means. So it's usually more so in the self-driving. Autonomous is a little bit more of a nebulous word that a lot of consumers don't understand, uh, and it also does not translate well into um, um, standard um, um, simplified Chinese. So it, we just asked it in two different ways. Um, what we're asking in that, and we we had a longer description, is about fully self-driving cars. So the L4 type um, uh, um, self-driving cars that uh, can be fully um, controlled, and there needs to be no uh, vehicle handoff um, to the driver in, in inclement weather or getting off a, a highway ramp and things like that. Thank you. That was the last one. Thanks so much, Colin. All right. All right. Sure, Thank yeah. you, Colin, for that. Thank you for that excellent presentation, and thank you all for your questions and attending today's webinar. This webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Auto Care Association website under www.autocare.org, what we do, professional development, education, industry analysis webinar series within the next week. Thank you again for participating. Our next webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, September 21st at 2 p.m. Eastern on the topic, Global Forecasting, Auto Industry Update. Thank you.